I think today's discussion is extremely topical uh, because, as we all know, of the Russian attack on Ukraine, that seems especially worrisome for the region uh, that still is dealing with its own legacy of, of conflicts. Um, you may also be aware that uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina um, is facing one of its uh, most difficult crises. Um, in the Munich meeting just this past weekend, Josep Borrell uh, called the situation on the ground critical. Um, and we want to talk about today with people that are actually not only knowledgeable about the region, but in the region and can, us, can tell us how critical it is. Um, the, the whole story in a way started was triggered by um, uh, an imposed law by the high representative that criminalized the denial of genocide and war crimes. That is not to say that that was the cause of it. Um, it should be said that this crisis represents um, uh, in, in a way, a confluence of a series of unresolved issues that have been simmering for a very long time. Um, in addition to the imposed law, uh, the dominant leader of Republika Srpska, one of the members of the presidency, Milora Dodik, uh, started devising a plan for secession, this time uh, not only uh, as a discursive plan, but has taken steps to actually uh, introduce uh, its own judicial body, tax administration office, setting up border control, and more, most boringly, also announcing that uh, he would create um, an own army of Republika Srpska. At the same time, and that is probably the, the latest development, we have a more forceful Bosnian Croat community that has been quite uh, vocally advocating for the creation of a third entity in Bosnia and Herzegovina for many years, but recently has basically stood against uh, any electoral law that would uh, prevent the organization of, of elections in October, unless it is based on the fact that the Croats get their rightful as, as they claim representation within the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The narrative in Replica Srpska, where 50% of the lawmakers uh, have agreed with Nora Dodik, and I, I would like to stress this, it's 50% rather than 90% or 100%, um, with the secessionist plans that Dodi has devised. The narrative is to take back control and to return to the original date, and again, something uh, that we can discuss. However, our main focus today is on the international context, which is where it all gets interesting. Um, Milar Dodik is seen as supported by not only Bosnian Croats, who uh, play hand in glove with his plans, but also Slovenia, Russia, China, the Croatian president discursively supports him. Um, and Dodik has even uh, been pledged to receive financial backing from Hungary and from the regime of Viktor Orban. Uh, the role of Serbia is, is also extremely interesting, playing it uh, on the one hand to Brussels, on the other hand to uh, the population of Serbia. So moderating on the one hand, but encouraging on the other. Um, the US, as we know, has sanctioned Dodik and some individuals and a TV station, uh, but the EU has so far not been able to jointly uh, uh, sanction uh, Republika Srpska because of some of the actors that I mentioned that are against uh, this move. So we might want to talk about the individual EU member states and, and what their positions have been. Today, as we know that uh, now a hot conflict in Ukraine is un 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 unfolding, the Bosnian crisis can be only expected to slip uh, further down the line of, of the priority list. Uh, but after 26 years of peace building and democratization, international actors really do seem to be at a loss in the country in terms of what to do. But our main question is, not only has the international actors lost the plot, but is it even their role today to be acting as the main ushers, if you like, of Bosnian democracy uh, and peace? So what is their role today? How can they steer the crisis? And should they even be steering the crisis? Or should we really be talking about the domestic politics in the case of Bosnia? We have a very distinguished panel to discuss these issues uh, with both scholars and practitioners or scholars turned practitioners and vice versa. Um, we're deeply grateful to have you here uh, as you are extremely knowledgeable about the region. So let me briefly introduce you and pose you each a very quick warm up question that will hopefully set the scene for us. Jelena Jankic is a professor of, uh, in, in the Global Governance Program at the Robert Schumann Center um, of the European University Institute in Florence, where she also co-directs the Global Citizenship Observatory and directs the GGP West Balkans Program. Jelena, uh, let me ask you, I already um, panned out a little bit of how the crisis has been, has been unfolding, but from your perspective and in your experience, um, how is this crisis different from the previous ones? Do you see this as a more serious threat to the Bosnian integrity? And should we really be worried about the peace in Bosnia um, for, 
here's the, here's the field to you, the virtual screen to you. Thank you so much, uh, Jesse, and thanks for, for inviting me uh, to be a part uh, of this panel. It's it's really a great pleasure to to contribute to to this discussion on on Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, to your question. Now, first of all, this is a very, very delicate moment for Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in my opinion, uh, and this is a very much a personal opinion that I have, um, judging it against other events, it's another crisis within Bosnia and also within the region would be very, very difficult. Um, as we all know, Bosnia and Herzegovina is a country that has experienced the bloodiest conflict in Europe uh, in the 1990s, but it also has experienced various, let's say, uh, different scale crises, uh, including the one that's related to constitutional reform, which has been in a sort of a limbo for the last 12 years or so, um, ever since the Sadie infancy judgment uh, of the European Court of, of Human Rights. Uh, the reason for this are related to the last part of the question that, that you posed for today's discussion are essentially the power balances that are ingrained in the, uh, let's say, post datum Bosnia and Herzegovina. And these power balances are a sort of a remnant of the conflict that has been translated from the battlefield into the constitutional setup of the country. And this framework, I think this is the question here, uh, whether this framework has enabled, even if indirectly, the situation that we have today to unfold because it allowed the ethnic elites as opposed to citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina to take ownership of the country's uh, post-war transformation. Now, we'll talk about the importance or the roles of the different actors within this process and to what extent they have or have not uh, contributed, been able to contribute, et cetera, to, to this context. But I think the uh, important issue here to focus on, in my view, is this misbalance uh, of uh, and uh, deadlocks that have been created in post-conflict Bosnia by the state capture and the capture of society by, by ethnic elites. So I'll, 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 I'll just leave the rest for later. <laughs> No, I think that sets the domestic scene really well as well, and then we can basically uh, plot the international actors on that. Um, Dejan, I'd like to invite you next. Dejan Jovic is a professor of international relations at the Faculty of Political Sciences at the University of Zagreb, where he's the head of the Department of International Politics and Diplomacy, and probably doesn't need that much introduction to this audience. Dejan, if I may, what is the take in Zagreb regarding the crisis? We, there seems to be a lot of dissonance between the prime minister and the president uh, most of the time. Um, and what is the view from Zagreb? Is this taken as a potential threat to regional stability? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and to be in a position to talk about some of these issues. I mean, first of all, what we see in Croatia is uh, that Bosnia and Herzegovina is again um, very high on the agenda of its foreign policy. And um, this is in a way uh, somewhat, that, that position is somewhat competing with another one with at least nominal claim that the main objective of Croatian foreign policy is further integration into European structures. That means joining um, Eurozone and Schengen. And uh, Croatia in fact wants somehow to uh, reconcile these two or to link these two and to use um, the process of so-called Europeanization, that is EU enlargement and uh, European future for Bosnia and Herzegovina, to achieve some specific um, uh, political objectives within Bosnia and Herzegovina and primarily linked with the position and the status of Croats in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So in a way, this is a kind of an, an unusual situation in which you use the rhetoric of Europeanization, the uh, position you have within the European Union, uh, the, the, uh, where your members of European Parliament lobby permanently on behalf um, of Bosnian Croats, and in particular here, um, of the position that is being um, articulated by HDZ BNH, that is the ruling party, which is a kind of, it has never been completely separated from the uh, HDZ uh, Croatia. 
And um, I think this position is in a way, um, I think it makes the whole thing interesting, I think, from the point of view of European uh, or EU foreign policy, because the question really is, um, does the European Union really want to um, <clears throat> be used uh, by Croatia in particular as an instrument um, of further ethno-nationalism or of supporting and encouraging ethno-nationalist positions in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as uh, you've already mentioned, uh, Bosnian Croats are now very close with uh, Milorad Dodik and the uh, Republic of Srpska. Um, Croatian President Milanovic um, has actually, is actually, has actually said that uh, whoever in Croatia votes for sanctions against Dodik is betraying national interests. Um, he even threatened uh, verbally NATO um, by blocking uh, or vetoing some of one of its uh, recent resolution for not mentioning. The, the concept of constituent nations, something that is a sacred uh, element of Croatian political rhetoric, uh, very much uh, linked with the Dayton structure. And he criticized the Croatian prime minister, um, quite paradoxically, um, for being um, rather tolerant towards um, some of the expressions that found its way, their way into EU reports on, on Bosnia and Herzegovina, also for not mentioning the position of ethnic Croats. So uh, I would say that this also is linked with domestic uh, politics in Croatia. I mean, what we see primarily by President Milanovic, who comes from the social democratic side of Croatian politics, uh, nominally at least, although he's no longer a member. And that is the so-called, I would call this demessagization of Croatian politics, in particular when it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina. We all remember this concept of detujmanization. De 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 in the early 2000s, I think this, this has now been completely abolished. Croatia has come back to the solid um, Tujmanist uh, position when it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Some would criticize, I would I share this view, Croatian foreign policy for actually echoing only and copy pasting requests by the Bosnian Croats, or that is HDZ BNH, without really taking sufficiently into account that what Bosnian Croats want um, might not be in the best interest of Croatia, might actually lead Croatia into uh, further away from mainstream European uh, political uh, position when it comes to uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, but I think Croatia is very much focused on, on the issue of Bosnia-Herzegovina, I think, too much. Uh, it would be in the best Croatian interest, I think, to uh, clearly distinguish between the legitimate interests of Bosnia and Croats and the interests of the Republic of Croatia, which might not coincide, might not be the same, just because this is the what I also think about the, the need to distinguish between the interests of Bosnian Serbs, that is Republic of Serbska, and the interests of the Republic of Serbia. Because in the 1990s, we all remember that actually because of Bosnian Croats, Bosnian Serbs and Croatian Serbs, Republic of Serbia has actually suffered some major negative international consequences, including international sanctions and so on and so forth. Thank you, Dan. I think Nebojša, our next speaker, will actually touch upon some of these issues. Let me introduce our next speaker, uh, Nebojša Vladisavljevic, who is professor at the Faculty of Political Science at the University of Belgrade, who teaches comparative politics. Thank you for joining us. Um, Nebojša, I'd like to ask you about how the, the threat of potential secession is perceived in Serbia, because a, a lot of the discourse is also joining with, with, uh, with Serbia, that RS would join Serbia, and so on and so on. So what is what is the view from Zagreb and uh, from Belgrade, and, and do people even even care about these issues right now? Uh, normally, uh, many people in Serbia would be interested in what happens in Bosnia, uh, but at this point, uh, actually, it's just a sideshow. Uh, very few people care about it, and there are two reasons for this. One is that we are facing a kind of uh, uncertain election. Uh, we have uh, elections in early April. And these are not kind of typical democratic elections uh, in which you just choose government. Uh, it is more about choosing the regime, whether we keep authoritarianism that we've had in the last few years, or whether we move back to democracy. So, you know, energies of both government and opposition are focused on elections and not on other issues, and also much of the general public. The second point is uh, kind of most people in Serbia don't really take seriously what Dodik uh, says, because in the last 15 years, when it comes to this rhetoric of secession, it's been exactly that, you know, rhetoric. 
so even if perhaps this time is something different, uh, you know, people just uh, ignore it and do not pay attention to it. But again, of course, you have a, the official position about what happens in Bosnia. And, uh, and your, this position is that uh, they are against unilateral moves from any side, and that includes you know, secessionist um, attempt. Uh, and even if you move further to kind of informal politics, our autocrat uh, Vucic uh, wouldn't really want another issue uh, to deal with in the middle of the election campaign and, you know, having to deal with Kosovo and now Ukraine, he wouldn't want some sort of um, destabilization in uh, Bosnia. Uh, even if it is about, uh, you know, uh, RS uh, secession. And he's just, he cannot say this openly because, uh, you know, there is a section of voters in Serbia that support Dodik, so Vucic cannot criticize Dodik openly in the middle of the election campaign. So it's complex, but uh, mostly people either ignore what is happening in Bosnia at this point or wouldn't want any significant change. Thank you so much. That was a great, succinct answer to that. Um, Yasmin, and finally to you and the view from Sarajevo. Um, let me introduce uh, my dear friend Yasmin Hasic, who's an assistant professor of political science at the Sarajevo School of Science and Technology and the executive director of Humanity in Action, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, Yasmin, um, if I could ask you to give us a flavor of the mood in Sarajevo right now um, and how the latest escalations, especially regarding the acts of Dragan Čović um, and the, cre uh, the approval in the RS Assembly of the creation of a new judiciary ha has been perceived and how seriously it is actually perceived in Sarajevo. Because as Nebojša said, sometimes there's this feel that, you know, we've seen this before, we've been there, how is this different then? Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Jesse, for your wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's not much different, to be very honest. It's, it's another round of flexing muscles, and this is how it's perceived in the major media and the circles of academics and people who, in, in one way or another, follow the politics. Um, here, um, we need to sort of contextualize this within the agenda of, of the centralization versus centralization of Bosnia and Herzegovina, one original datum fighting the transformational datum, um, the contexts of whether a Republika Srpska should exist or shouldn't exist. So it's a continuation of a very large uh, conversation that's been going on since 95 until today. And uh, those who fight for decentralization try to present this as a panacea for stability in Bosnia every every constituent nation or peoples as, as the constitution refers to should have their own uh, space under the sun. Everybody should have some sort of uh, self-governing rule in order to secure their own uh, ontological securities and centralization uh, as, as an opposite of this is an ontological insecurity uh, which can only lead to further destabilization of the system and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the tale and the conflict is very old uh, but the perceptions of it, as, as I agree with Nebojša, are already familiar. Uh, Mr. Dodik already had a similar referendum on secession before the last elections. Now uh, he has a new law which will enter into force in the next 18 months. So after the elections, after he sees what, what kind of result he will produce with this and so on and so forth. So it's, everything is suspended, everything is delayed, everything is just put on the table to see uh, who can win the most out of the negotiations here. But uh, what I wanted to refer in this longer conversation of uh, securitization versus the securitization in Bosnia, well, the securitization in Bosnia uh, cannot um, work in the long run because securitization of, of, of three ethnic groups, of two entities, of every discussion that we have in the country on a daily basis now uh, is used as a governance tool. And everybody who wants to try to, to try to change this narrative, the EU, the US, every, every other actor is powerless to do it because they only offer a, a new strategic culture of, of the society which has a prosperous future, which can be a fully functional state, which can uh, enable their citizens to, to live a fuller life with, uh, with competencies and, 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 and economic benefits and so on and so forth. However, every strategy, every strategic culture that anybody coming 
from the outside offers in Bosnia has not addressed this essence of ontological insecurity, which Mr. Dodik and everybody else is trying to sort of uh, push uh, at the forefront of every discussion. So every time the EU comes in, uh, he says that the EU is the tool of Bosniaks that would eliminate Republika Srpska. Or whenever the US comes with a certain uh, set of benefits to the country, uh, he also portrays this as an anti-Serbian sentiment, which is long running and it, which, which is dividing the society society is such and such. So the current political configurations within the country and outside of the country are not actually tackling this ontological insecurity as such. And this is why at the beginning of your question, this is why everybody uh, can do pretty much whatever they want and test everybody else's, their own muscles and everybody else's muscles and suspend the result until sort of new round of negotiation comes up and then they can change and revise and propose new strategies and so on and so forth. And this is why we have this conversation for the last 25, 27 years, because the same methods have been used, securitization as a governance tool, which nobody has addressed uh, in a very deep and, and, and very meaningful sense thus far. Thank you. So in a way, you're suggesting there's a bit of a pragmatic complacency because we've, we've been there before. Yet let us still focus on what what makes this different and how has the, the international context actually changed since 2006, 2008? Uh, and what is the role of, of international actors in, in, in helping or assisting Bosnia in this case? We've seen some negative effects of international assistance and I think we will also touch upon some of them. So let me again uh, turn the table over to Jelena to start us again. Um, specifically, Jelena, um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about uh, what you already uh, kind of uh, alluded to, the dynamics between the domestic uh, actors and the international community and how they might have been uh, misreading each other uh, and what the main focus in your view should be uh, and has been and in what it has been and potentially wrongly has been. So what is your analysis of that and specifically probably focusing on the European Union or um, some of the actors within the European Union? for about five, seven minutes. Jesse, you practically want me to write the book in five to seven minutes. <laughs> Pretty um, much. Yeah. When speaking about the international actors in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I, I, and I don't want to reinvent the wheel here, um, I think we can think of them in terms of different circles, right? You have those that have an international mandate to act in Bosnia and Herzegovina. You have then the kin states of some of the constituent peoples. And then you have another circle of international actors that can act or the others, if you want, in terms of international actors that can act either through the kin states uh, of constituent peoples or exercise their own um, interests and influences. And these interests and influences of all of these uh, international actors that can be placed in, in different boxes can be very different, also substantively. They can be political interests, business interests, but also ideological interests. So what I'm trying to say is that um, the agendas of and the strategies of all of these actors in the context of Bosnia and Herzegovina have been not only incoherent, uh, but also sometimes conflicting uh, if, if, if you wish to go uh, for, for a less optimistic view. Now, in combination uh, with the ethnic strongholds of power, uh, these different agendas have ultimately had, well, their implications on the democratization of the country and as we could see also on its, uh, on its stability. Uh, but I think in general at this political moment, stability is perhaps not only um, an idiosyncrasy uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but it's rather, um, it's, it's, it's rather, I would say at different levels regional, but this is something for perhaps the discussion. Uh, so to, to in a way, if we take a look at what's going on in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, in the moment, and if we take a look at what the general role of these stabilizing factors in Bosnia should have been, it was to bring democracy and stability. Now, if you focus on these two things, you'll see that one democracy has been back sliding and stability is if you wish on on thin ice um now um i think media policy analysts but also a share of uh, of academic works 
um, in a way we try to um, we try to see uh, that that the European Union and the United States have had a um, very important role on keeping Bosnia conflict free and keeping it uh, reform uh, in terms of democracy, in terms uh, of um, of rights of different communities, et cetera, et cetera. And these have been seen as the dominant actors that were charged in a way, or at least normatively, uh, with safeguarding peace and democracy uh, in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, at the same time, while there is this broad agreement on the, on the fact that these should, be, should have been guarantors of peace in Bosnia, there's a huge disagreement on what this role should have entailed and to what extent they should or should not intervene in, in the Bosnian uh, context, whether the US and the EU should be hands on on the processes of democratization and reform, et cetera, in Bosnia, or whether the ownership over these processes should be with the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, in, in a different context, uh, one perhaps could even give a straightforward answer. So the ownership of political processes should be with the Bosnian people. One thing to remember in the context of Bosnia is that there's this extra layer of ethnic elites, which have ca captured not only the institutional context of Bosnia, but also its society. And I think we can see this very well in the case of uh, Dodik, who's now mobilizing nationalist sentiments of uh, the people in the Republika Srpska for his own political uh, political purposes and political objectives. And he's using the institutions effectively to, to do this. Now, if you take a look at what's been done uh, by the international community or those two guarantors of peace, the, the US and the EU, um, the US sanctions, both the US sanctions and what the EU is trying to do are at, the level, at one level very individual. So uh, the visas and personal assets of Dodek and a couple of other people have been frozen, but nothing has been done uh, in a larger context, right? And I think even doing something in a larger context raises a lot of questions because effectively, as we have learned from uh, sanctions in the 90s, those who suffer the consequences of sanctions are not politicians. It's, it's normally uh, people in, in those countries, which then fuels further the grievances that fuel nationalist, uh, nationalist sentiments. Um, so what I hope to see uh, in the future um, would be discussions on the situation uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina within the EU. Um, but what we, what we realistically uh, can expect is not a super vigorous discussion. And there are two reasons for, uh, for this. One is the current situation in the Ukraine, which I think um, may overshadow some of the issues that are happening in the Balkan region, at least at the level of, uh, of EU's policy for, for at the moment. Um, the second thing are the, and this is something that I think also Dea has mentioned in his introductory speech, uh, the liberal politics within the EU, which I think are a major concern and how these could then play out in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I think that those are the factors that uh, that essentially um, have to be taken into account when looking at the role of the EU and what the EU should or should not do in Bosnia. Now, as you have seen, I'm, I'm staying away from being prescriptive because it, it's not on me to say what someone should or should not do. Uh, as an analyst, I can tell you where the dynamics could possibly go, but I think we we would need also to be careful in saying, okay, they should kind of take hold of the process or they should let go. But I, you may agree to disagree and I would be happy to listen to, to other views. Thank you so much, Elena. I think that's that's fair enough. And we might get into it in the, in the Q&A. 
Um, Dan, I'd like to ask you next. You've um, you've already covered a lot of ground with the with the dynamics between Bosnia and Croats and Croatia. Um, there might be more things we might want to add. So maybe if I could steer you in the direction of talking more about the Yelena already mentioned illiberal members, if you like, of the European Union, Slovenia, Hungary, and you know Milanovic, president of Croatia, acting in that way as well, and potentially having a plan to turn Croatia in that as well. And what has been their stake in Bosnia? Um, there's a lot of conspiracy theories floating around. So do they have? What is the the type of stake they have, and how can they actually influence um, the situation? Okay, uh, I mean, I, if I focus just a little bit more, I mean, I will take this into account, but also on this issue of has international community lost the plot, I think I would, I would really like to link it with this liberal component, because we need to, for, to remember that, in fact, if we go back to 1995, that's the Dayton moment, really, for Bosnia and Herzegovina, I mean, uh, that was the Dayton moment was, a, a, it looked like a victory of the West, uh, after a terrific loss um, of the West, after terrific, terrific defeat, in fact, of the West in 1991, 1992. I mean, just go back to the end of the Cold War. I mean, the big mantra was, you know, liberal Europe, no alter, there is no alternative to that. And uh, the whole world will now, at least in Europe, will democratize, which will lead to peace. Of course, Bosnian case in particular, but also the whole collapsing of former Yugoslavia in blood. Uh, very strongly challenged that liberal idea of the liberal peace and even democratic peace that elections you know lead to to peace not to war and then we had really um, a big victory of the west in 1995 through Dayton agreement which then uh, really defeated uh, ethnic separatism re re-established Bosnia and Herzegovina and offered uh, Western guarantees for its existence, for its survival. And I think we need to remember that because it is, I think, still now, uh, 25 years since, um, the, the fact that the survival of Bosnia-Herzegovina in long term is closely linked with the Western domination and the Western hegemony in Europe, and that is also in Western Balkans too. Um, I think we, we see what is happening, for example, to uh, existence of Ukraine and of Georgia and of other countries, maybe tomorrow Moldova or whatever, um, if and when there is no uh, guarantees of that uh, type, of that nature, if and when the Western guarantees once given uh, back in the end of the Cold War for independence of these countries and for their security, uh, it is no longer with us. So I think that's the first thing we need to, it is still the case that the stability of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also international order in the Western Balkans is largely reliant on the hegemony of the, of the West. Now, what is now happening with this position of the West uh, compared to the rest um, in these 25 years? I think it's very clear that, you know, the West is, uh, losing plot <laughs> i don't i would not dramatize i don't think it's disappearing or anything like that we, we're not seeing you know turning europe into a kind of uh, you know bipolar completely in all its um, uh, territories and 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 uh, areas but certainly it is uh, losing its influence and it's facing serious challengers uh, who come from somewhere else and who are to a large degree anti-western but also in particular anti-european and in this context, I think, in the context of Bosnia and Herzegovina, of course, um, you know, a failure of Bosnia and Herzegovina would actually mean it would have dramatic consequences for further weakening of the position of the West in Europe and in global in global terms. Just to remind ourselves of of some of the uh, of the elements of this weakening of the West in, since 1995, which are then destabilizing, I think, Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also the whole situation in Western Balkans. I mean. First of all, you know, in 1995, you know, we, we didn't have Putin or Erdogan. I mean, they came later on. They largely came, in particular, I think, Putin as a response to the Western policies over Kosovo. I mean, you see how is Putin using Kosovo all the time, in fact, and how he might be focused and interested in defeating the West uh, on that on that particular uh, issue elsewhere, but also 
perhaps one day in the Balkans uh, too. Um, we also had this uh, United States focusing somewhere else, um, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, and actually being uh, weakened in, in all these uh, interventions they, they had later on. We also saw Ukrainian crisis, we saw the crisis in Syria and so on and so forth. And I think ultimately what demonstrates the weakness of the West compared to its promise of 1989 is hesitation of the European Union to complete the process of EU enlargement. And I mean, I've been talking about this for the last 10 years, so I don't want to really to repeat it, but I think the European Union has made a huge mistake uh, when imposing and inventing new and new and new and tougher and tougher criteria and placing more and more obstacles for countries of the Western Balkans and Bosnia Herzegovina in particular to join it. I mean, it is it is it has been acting in a self-defeating. Uh, mood and, and and system, and it has defeated its its own project. Uh, it had, it, I think, it ought to uh, have taken uh, Bosnia Herzegovina in the European Union without placing any further obstacles, just as it is at the moment. And it would have been Bosnia Herzegovina would have been much better off, and European Union would have been a much better off today than it is at the moment. And I think in, in particular also some other mistakes have been made, I think that had weakened the Western, um, the, the Western influence over these countries. For example, this thing with uh, recognition of Kosovo in 2008, which, which I think really is now backfiring, not only in the area by being used by Putin, but also by raising hopes of the Republic of Serbia in particular, that they too might become uh, independent at uh, some moment and also then uh, continuing the process of disintegration of Yugoslavia, which started in 1991, but it ended only in 2008. So for the long 18, 17, 18 years and so on and so forth. What has also happened, I think, on the ground that has somehow raised the question of uh, how permanent these guarantees by the West through date and actually were, is the changing uh, nature of, inter of, the, of, the, of the regional balance, the nature of international relations within the region. I mean, Croatia becoming member of the European Union, but Bosnia and Serbia not. Um, I think this has disturbed somewhat uh, the balancing of power within the region. And uh, it has uh, also given some more um, possibility uh, for, for Croatia to uh, to act uh, in a politically interventionist uh, way within uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. In Bosnia itself, which I think also is a source of, of a crisis, uh, we have seen uh, the changing ethno-demographic structure of, this, of, of, of the population. For the first time, we now have one ethnic group being a majority of the, the whole population, which also raises hopes on the side of Bosniaks that uh, they could probably uh, even through democratic system, without consociation and without get, with getting rid of, of all these uh, consociational elements for other ethnic groups that could actually be better off than they are um, at the moment. So I think all these elements have very much influenced uh, the situation in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, now, what I think uh, we should do now, I think, first of all, uh, the West should uh, repeat security guarantees if they can um, to Bosnia-Herzegovina, it, its commitment to survival of Bosnia-Herzegovina, and therefore they should counter all these, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, claims that Bosnia is about to disintegrate. I think when we say that Bosnia is about to, to fall apart, we are not doing any favor to Bosnia-Herzegovina, in fact. I think the, the clear narrative that this this will not happen, this cannot happen, because for as long as the West is the dominant power in the Western Balkans, is much needed. So I'm I'm a bit skeptical and uh, critical of of, of various uh, you know expressions of panics um, about the imminent disintegration of of Bosnia and Herzegovina. This is not helping uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And then the second thing, if the West cannot keep its promise, then I suppose they should open up negotiations with others, um, other external factors in the region. I wouldn't like to see that. Although, for example, President Milanovic is, is offering exactly that. Of President Milanovic has in, been inviting Erdogan into negotiation, further talks about the future of Bosnia. This is a step towards inviting Putin by, by Dodik. So by actually misplacing, displacing, uh, moving Bosnia away from the Western area into a more global area where Putin and Erdogan are factors and America as a third factor without Europe. 
Well, I think this is very damaging and problematic. It weakens the European Union, but it's up to European Union to respond to that and to say, we don't need um, the third actors, external actors. We can actually give that sort of guarantees to Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, by our own. I think the greatest danger for Bosnia and Herzegovina at the moment is, 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 is if we face another moment of chaos and anarchy, just as we did in the Balkans in 1991. And uh, I'm afraid that actually with this uh, Russian uh, intervention in Ukraine, unless the West is, has, is, is, is about to move very quickly and open the doors to Bosnia and Herzegovina and the whole Western Balkans immediately to join the European Union, we are leaving this area um, uh, up in the open, in fact, and uh, possibly um, also pushing it towards a situation in which there, there might be a proxy, uh, not maybe proxy wars, but certainly a play field for uh, competition of um, external powers against the West. Thank you very much, Dan. I think there's also a bit of a fear that um, if we have now some liberal members of the European Union, that I think the European Union is also quite reluctant to accept more members that could potentially join that club and, and so to speak, reinforce that, that camp. So, you know, that's maybe something that we can talk about and, uh, because we've, we've seen these propositions that uh, Western Balkans should have joined the European Union ages ago. And now the situation, as you say, is becoming a lot more complex with Mr. Orban, uh, Yansha and the likes, um, basically joining forces with, with right wings. Um, anyway, Yasmin, over to you. Uh, lots to unpack, but um, obviously I would like to tap into your experience at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a political advisor um, and tell us a little bit about what the diplomacy can actually do right now and what are the options on the table. We've talked a little bit about sanctions, how effective can they be or not. Um, who is pursuing what? And I think we tend to also talk a lot about especially Miller Dodic. The whole focus has always been on Miller Dodic and Replica Srpska. Now only recently the Bosnian Croat story has started coming into the picture. But tell us more. We don't really hear about what the Bosniak side is doing. What is Sarajevo actually doing? And when we talk about Sarajevo, who do we actually mean by Sarajevo? Is it the Council of the Ministers? You know, is it the this the government at, at the federation level? Are we talking about the two two presidents of the presidency? You know, the situation is extremely complex in Bosnia. So when we talk about Sarajevo, who are we even talking about? I also share the sentiment that I'm also confused when we talk about Sarajevo, who are we speaking about? Because Bosnian foreign policy uh, governance, our architecture is polycentric in its essence. And we're not talking about Sarajevo as Sarajevo or Sarajevo Banja Luka or Mostar or Venn diagram of Mostar and Zagreb and uh, Banja Luka and Belgrade. So polycentricity in that kind of uh, sense, but also polycentricity in the sense of uh, institutional setup being uh, so um, constitutionally dispersed so that every institution on the Council of Minister level shares some kind of competency within the foreign policy. So Ministry of Foreign Affairs, obviously, the most competencies are vested within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but many other ministries uh, can easily swing um, and change the dynamics of the game themselves. Um, the problem here is that this polycentricity has become deinstitutionalized over time and then uh, whoever runs the ministry of xyz or the presidency members are actually the embodiment of the strength of the institution that they represent rather than institution being strong or weak and whoever runs it you know you know your position within the system this position and this power led relations are are actually changing every time you change the players within the institution. So this is why um, perhaps this is so confusing even um, to me who have been studying this and you uh, asking the question and everybody else wondering, but also as the person who, who had the opportunity to be part of the system and sort of practice um, this foreign policy uh, agenda within the Bosnian system. But in any case, uh, what I wanted to showcase uh, with this polycentricity sort of approach is that um, uh, it's not about uh, the power relations or the political psychology, as you say, over-focusing on Dodik, over-focusing on agents, but uh, the pathological sort of relationships between the institutions which are taken as the new normal and nobody even contests them, right? So nobody comes in, uh, no foreign institutions uh, come in with the clear set of rules, set, set of gu guidelines on how things should move forward, how institutions should be strengthened, but they actually play into the games. 
So they deinstitutionalized decision making on election law by taking political party leaders to Neum to actually agree on the law there first on a political level and then take it through the institutions because this this is the uh, how they know that that's going to be the only way to to pass the law if such and many other examples on eu coordination mechanism also adopted at the, at the nearby cafe in istochna sarevo and so on so for so many examples of this pathology and the international community unfortunately playing into it knowing that this is perhaps the only way of how they can get the results and how they can cash in their mandates in terms of uh, achieving real diplomatic uh, or other, uh, other successes, which they can then use for their own benefits or the benefits of the countries or institutions they're representing. Um, so when it comes to uh, my personal view, maybe I will share a little bit of this. Uh, when it comes to this polycentricity of Bosnian foreign policy and why don't we think of Sarajevo only when we think of Sarajevo as the, as the uh, capital of this foreign policy governance architecture, uh, there are several reasons, uh, reasons I took down because uh, in preparing for this session, things have changed so many times. There are so many examples and then Ukraine's becoming you know uh, the number one story but some things uh, are are uh, stable in this respect so i just wanted to um highlight a couple of those so uh what uh foreign policy governance in bosnia from my own view as, as a practitioner back then um is featured uh, uh with is that it's not rule-based and it has probably never been in the in the time when i uh, served there, uh, there were no practical rules. There were uh, quarrels about the interpretations of the constitution pretty much every day. And there is no law on foreign policy. And there are uh, guidelines that are in place that are adopted by the presidency, but not respected either by institutions or, or the agents uh, uh, sort of carrying out the foreign policy as such. Uh, it's becoming less institutionalized because um, it is it is very unusual, but the institutions in reality do not talk to each other. This horizontal connection is very much absent, and this is something that that is per perhaps assumed from the outside, but not as apparent as when you get into the institution and you want to um, sort of forge stronger relationships, uh, have uh, clearer strategies or action plans on how to do it. The absence of communication and clear, um, clear connections is very, very an obstacle, is, is a huge obstacle in this, in this respect. Um, the foreign policy governance is mostly uh, and most commonly actually context uh, based and it's certainly uh, going with the flow. The flow is not all, always created within Bosnia, obviously it comes from different centers uh, abroad and it adjusts uh, to it as such. Uh, unfortunately, it is very party embedded and this is no surprise to anybody and the decisions are usually made somewhere else and then institutionalized just as the examples I've named just a couple of minutes ago and finally top-down sort of relationships which are uh, not very usual uh, or very uh, unusual for Bosnia because we live in in, in a part of the world and part of a uh, part of the European region which is uh, pretty much uh, focusing on an authoritarian regime semi authoritarian regimes uh, our our local politicians have acquired the taste of it they've uh, they've uh, tried to behave or imitate this 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 type of uh, relations here so uh, top down driven politics i will just give uh, in a in a i know we're running out of time because everybody um, is using more than they were awarded but i will just uh, give you a couple of examples of how i've seen this uh, in place or in practice actually uh, when I worked there. And I will give you just some of the things that are uh, changing and shifting uh, in terms of how polycentricity in foreign po policy governance in Bosnia works in practice. So when we talk about cooperation, um, one assumption uh, is that people do not cooperate or cooperate on very, very few uh, policy agenda. Uh, however, uh, the cooperation can only be defined as it happens when single parties cannot achieve their own goals on their own. 
So this is a definitional sort of uh, predisposition to cooperation taking place in Bosnia. And indeed, it, this has never changed. Uh, even when I looked at it from the outside or uh, being from the inside, cooperation is easily achievable when you, uh, when you need um, credits from uh, international monetary fund, all, all, uh, all disputes suddenly disappear. Everybody's raising their hands in the parliament if they need money, if they need to subsidize something and so on and so forth. However, in the recent time, this has also changed. There have been many attempts to actually uh, fundraise for certain projects in Bosnia, which are necessary for all three groups, but suddenly and very unexpectedly, uh, these political elites from Republika Srpska have actually rejected this type of cooperation, which, is, which was usually the modus operandi, and they have actually placed the public bonds on the uh, London um, stock market, which was very unusual and very um, uh, outside of the normal pattern of this cooperation alignment which existed before when everybody needs money. Conditionality, uh, the Republika Srpska elites again have many times tried to block um, the, the institutional decision making in the national sort of institutions of Bosnia and Herzegovina wherever they could, wherever they had the mechanisms to do so. However, uh, this is not always the case because sometimes when you need to appoint a ambassadors or when you need to uh, do something else, some decisions are actually taken, but the media is not actually putting them forward. So the people do not really understand that the blockage works for the general purpose, but it doesn't work when uh, certain favors among the three members of the presidency, for instance, are needed. So some of the recent ambassadors have been appointed without any problems, uh, but this, this has not been put, put forward. Uh, containment, yes, the Bosniak Croats are lobbying for something, um, let's say, in the West, and they try to contain the Serbian voices in the West, vice versa. Serbian political elites are trying to um, uh, lobby for their own purposes uh, in the East. They're trying to contain the voices of the other two there. Uh, and there was never, in, in my time in the, in the cabinet, an opportunity where uh, 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 Bosnia Croats would go to Russia and try to sort of persuade and put voices forward there. However, there have been recent changes, obviously, to this, and, and uh, Madame Turk which also went uh, to Russia. There have been many visits, successful or unsuccessful, we can debate about this, uh, but there, have been, there has been an opening of the Bosniak political elites to actually um, voice their concerns and voice their grievances somewhere where they usually don't practice or preach uh, whatever they, they feel is necessary. We know they do it in the West and how successful they do it, it's also another issue, but uh, the change of strategies of Milorad Dodik turning to the West for, for some favors and Bosnian representatives turning to the East is, is kind of different in, in this setup. And finally, soft power of attraction, um, which is mainly used uh, in the foreign policy by, by Bosnian uh, political elites. And this is no surprise uh, uh, in that respect. However, the advocacy is, lit, uh, is missing a certain link because going abroad and asking for uh, genocide denial law or changes to the criminal law in terms of criminalizing genocide are perhaps good in, in itself, meaning for those who, who are advocating this, but there's a, there's a small piece missing. Uh, what do you get when you criminalize genocide and you have uh, a securitized sort of question on the other side, which can block the entire country and threaten secession and so on and so forth. So the missing link here was to advocate uh, for uh, genocide denial law, but also in combination with the new law on high treason, so that you can actually punish the people who are attacking the constitutional order in which they can actually threaten succession. Now in the criminal law, threatening succession can only be punished if actual violence takes place. Political agenda on success of secession in terms of referenda, in terms of adopting uh, different laws that actually uh, disrupt the current uh, governmental uh, architecture are actually not punishable by law. So not having a separate law on high treason where people with, uh, with, with a clear political agenda that threatens the entire stability of the country could be punished just by enacting this or propagating this or mobilizing people is simply insufficient uh, in itself. So we need the law 
to actually be imposed or being adopted in, in, in any, any form, shape or form uh, so that this genocide denial agenda could be complemented with something that could uh, uh, contain the destabilization that the first law produced. So I will stop here, obviously aware of the, of the time constraints here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yasmin. No, I think you outlined really well how complex uh, any policymaking in, in Bosnia really is in practice. But what you also said is that there is no law that can punish secessionist threats. But this is why the international, um, the high representative still exists, which is within the scope of his powers, which are extremely hard to exercise, as we know, and we might get into that. And I would like to actually touch upon the issue of what is now the role of the high representative in Bosnia these days. But let me turn over to Nebojša. Um, Nebojša, you, um, you wrote a lot extensively and a lot about the various reform packages uh, in Bosnia and what the constitutional and electoral reform could potentially look like. I'd like to ask you maybe to add a little bit more on what is the role of Serbia in all of this. And then um, at the backdrop of what both uh, Dejan and, and Yasmin were saying about the complexity of the Bosnian, Bosnian issue, what are the current prospects and stakes in, in pushing through the both the electoral as well as the constitutional reform? I know it's a lot, so you can basically pick and choose what, what you uh, feel like tackling. Um, I mean, when it comes to uh, institutional change or institutional reform, um, it's been a permanent feature of Bosnian politics since day 10, if there is any. Uh, so um, this time uh, it was uh, kind of triggered by uh, two issues one disputes over the election of a crop member of the tripartite presidency and also by um, uh, judgments by the european court of human rights uh, when it comes to the uh, discrimination of uh, others meaning those who, uh, who do not belong to three constituent nations when it comes to the elections in the tripartite presidency and in the upper house of Bosnia's parliament. But again, as Yasmin mentioned earlier, uh, this is uh, all happening within the context of this uh, old um, constitutional debate between those who uh, are in favor of kind of more centralized, fully functional state on the one hand, and uh, others who want to keep the original Dayton kind of a loose multinational federation based on uh, power sharing. Now, if we look at what happened uh, recently uh, with involvement of international actors, it seems that their preference is for highly limited um, electoral uh, change. Um, but in kind of a broader, uh, in a broader debate uh, uh, within Bosnia, but also uh, more broadly, you see uh, still uh, these demands for broader uh, constitutional package, if you want, that would um, kind of uh, relax this uh, exclusive focus on three constituent uh, nations and on um, uh, power sharing. And um, kind of there are uh, various obstacles to this broader kind of constitutional uh, package. Um, it seems to me internal and uh, external. Internally, there is no uh, agreement clearly um, on this. Uh, and it's not just Dodik uh, and Troy, I think it's much more popularly based opposition among uh, Serbian and Croatian um, parties who believe that uh, quite a lot of constitutional reform has already been done since they tend towards centralization. Uh, of Bosnia, but there is also a broader issue kind of of interest to comparativists, whether you can actually achieve more kind of civic uh, political mobilization um, uh, across and above ethnic divisions um, in a context of uh, uh, plural society such as that in Bosnia. And uh, we don't have time, I guess, for this discussion at the moment, but if anybody is interested, we can discuss it later in questions. Uh, my guess, based on um, the analysis of uh, plural societies, including Northern Ireland or uh, Cyprus, uh, is that you simply cannot achieve this sort of civic mobilization in the context in which elections resemble population censuses. Um, but again, there is uh, the external element. We've been discussing the role of uh, international actors um, 
in quite a lot of detail and very knowledgeably so far, but I think this focuses mostly on Bosnia as a special case. I think there is the broader uh, picture here comparatively if you look at um, what has changed since the 1990s or early 2000s in the international involvement uh, in post-conflict societies and more broadly when it comes to uh, international democracy uh, promotion. In the 1990s, in the early 2000s, there was quite a lot of intervention, uh, interventionist attitude uh, of Western democracy, especially the US, of course, and the EU. Um, when it comes to the transformation of post-conflict societies, including Bosnia, and there was quite a lot of international democracy promotion. Uh, in the last decade or decade and a half, this has uh, actually gone down quite a lot, not just in Bosnia, not just in, in the Balkans, uh, principally in the former Yugoslavia, but also in other regions. So this lower interest for what happened, what's happening in Bosnia is natural uh, if you look at uh, this kind of broader perspective. And um, I guess this sort of uh, understanding is reflected in this discussion of stabilitocracy, if you want, in our region, where uh, instead of democracy promotion, uh, EU is actually explicitly or implicitly supporting autocrats. Uh, who pretend that they are kind of interested in um, European integration. So I guess this sort of uh, hands-off uh, approach of the international community is just reflected in Bosnia. It's not something that is directly related to Bosnia as, um, as such. And there is another angle, I think, also, um, you would imagine and you would expect quite a lot of engagement of uh, international actors involved in post-conflict re reconstruction uh, in the few years after the end of conflict, after peace agreements. But you know, it's been a uh, quarter century or more since Dayton, so uh, we, would, we shouldn't be surprised that international actors are not that much uh, interested uh, at this point. Uh, when it comes to uh, the role of um, Serbia, it seems to me, I mean, I mentioned earlier in the response to the first question that uh, kind of uh, for Serbia, this is not the key issue uh, um, in the last few years, it hasn't been, uh, simply because it has other priorities. And uh, uh, when it comes to issues related to the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia, Kosovo is a priority essentially. And when it comes to Bosnia, uh, this government, authoritarian government of Vucic, but also previous democratic governments simply wanted some sort of status quo without destabilization that would draw them into something that they, they do not want. And that includes Dodik's adventures, if you can call them uh, that way. But again, they cannot often uh, openly criticized Dozik because he's always been an electoral asset for any government in Serbia in the last two decades. He's been very close personally uh, to uh, Kostunic and then Tadic and then, uh, and then Vucic. Um, so um, Serbia kind of tries to keep um, its uh, profile low. Uh, and if I can mention just uh, one bit which relates to uh, Republika Srpska when it comes to Dodik's secessionist kind of moves. Um, and generally it's assumed that uh, Dodik enjoys quite a lot of support when it comes to this sort of policy, but there's been quite a lot of opposition in Republika Srpska from um, Dodik's opposition. Um, they're strongly against this. Uh, um, and there are several reasons for this. Uh, one, again, they do not want uh, instability because they would probably assume that um, Dodik being in power has more resources to deal with this and kind of abuse this position electorally. Uh, they also do not want trouble in Bosnia and Herzegovina as a whole. Um, and what is probably the most important for them, for uh, opposition in uh, Republika Srpska, is that uh, they fear that uh, this sort of destabilization of Bosnia may actually end up 
um, with quite a lot of trouble for Republika Srpska itself. It may actually undermine uh, its autonomy within Bosnia and Herzegovina if these sanctions occur, if these personal sanctions shift to Republika Srpska as such, they realize that um, you know, it would be very difficult to actually remove them without major uh, compromises when it comes to the autonomy. So they realize this and they're strongly against any sort of adventures that would create um, instability. Uh, and they also feel much stronger electorally against Dodik at this point. There is a new generation of leaders in opposition in the Republic of Srpska, so they feel more powerful actually to oppose Dodik and shed this accusation of you know, being traitors uh, of the nation. Thank you very much, Musha. Um, we have um, about 30 minutes left, so I need to move on with uh, questions and answers. And if I could ask um, Julie to unmute um, some of the speakers, would it be possible to hear from 